Hello, everybody. It is Professor Razy again. So great to be with you on another K-12 STEM learning session Saturday. We have a really cool topic in store for you today, something I get really excited about, and I'm excited about it because I actually get to teach this at the University of Windsor. It's going to be in the area of medical physics, specifically medical imaging, a way of looking inside the body to detect and diagnose diseases really fast, uh, really uh, harmlessly, painlessly, very exciting technology that's leading to revolutions in the way medicine is practiced. So let's go ahead and dig into that right now. I will share this screen. Here it comes. All right. So I came up with this very cryptic title to kind of puzzle everybody today. And I called it uh, what you see here on the screen, M-I-N-M-R-I. -M uh, and to decipher that code, you actually have to say it out loud and say it fast and add a question mark at the end. Am I an MRI? Let's take a look. So if you see it spelled out this way, then you actually see what I'm talking about. Am I an MRI? Why, yes, I am an MRI. And these images here are images of MRI, and we're going to see what that is all about. How did you know? Because there are different other medical imaging modalities. There's x-rays and x-ray CTs and things that look like that, but these are MRI images. How did you know that was an MRI image? Well, let's dig into that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're talking about MRI. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and we're going to dive into that and learn about all things MRI. Why are we talking about it? Because as I said at the beginning, it's one of the most powerful methods we have today for looking inside your body without hurting you. There's no danger to you at all. You don't feel anything. It takes a little bit of time, but it's painless, completely non-damaging, and has exquisite resolution of some of the structures within your body. So this is an area that we call medical imaging, and I'm thrilled to be able to teach some of these classes at the University of Windsor. So speaking of that, the University of Windsor actually sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, the First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We respect the longstanding relationships with the First Nations people in this place and the 100-mile Windsor-Essex Peninsula and then the Straits of the of Detroit. We are very happy to be sharing this space, and we're really happy that you're sharing your time with us. So let's dive into MRI. So first off, I, when I teach this subject, I'm always really curious, has anyone I'm talking to actually been inside an MRI? Have they had an MRI? I actually have not. So I'm wondering, have you or someone else close to you in your family ever had an MRI? And you can type yes or no in the chat, and we can talk about that maybe at the end of the talk. If you're saying yes, I'm not surprised. It's actually a very common examination. Canada has about 2.33 million MRI exams per year. Obviously, if you're watching this from the United States, that's going to be a lot more than that. Um, so it's a pretty common exam. It's not an everyday type of thing, but certainly uh, when there are millions of these exams per year, that's a, that's a fairly common diagnostic test. So let's define MRI. MRI is a powerful way, as we said, of looking inside your body, looking through the skin into the internal structures without any pain or any bad consequences at all. And in fact, if you've never had an MRI or if no one in your family has ever had an MRI, one of the thing, ways that you're going to actually hear this phrase or see this phrase is if you follow sports. It is very, very common for high performance athletes to get MRI scans. Uh, NFL players, basketball players, track stars, um, hockey players, uh, they're going to get this MRI because it's so powerful at seeing soft tissue injuries like torn cartilage or when you tear the ACL, which is a ligament uh, in the knee, sprains, strains, etc. If you have a badly broken bone, x-rays will see that just fine. But most athletes, like here, I just did a quick Google search and I found a nice headline from one of the sports pages of Kevin Durant, the great basketball player. Here's the headline, Kevin Durant scheduled for an MRI on Tuesday. And this is a big, big deal, right? Because these athletes make millions of dollars and they need their body to be performing at 
the ultimate limit. And you can see here in this picture, it looks like Durant is, is he's clearly holding his ankle. An MRI scan is the only technique we have which is going to look in and see what's going on in that ankle that's hurting him. Is it a, a torn cartilage? Is it a torn ligament? Is there a small tear in the muscle, which would be sprains, strains, things like that? X-rays are not going to be able to see that, right? So that's kind of one of the points. If you have a badly broken bone, the X-rays will see it just fine. But for these types of, you know, especially sports-related repetitive stress injuries, MRI is really our best diagnostic tool for seeing these types of injuries. And we call those soft tissue injuries. So that's what I'm just saying here. The x-rays really aren't good at seeing these things. I bet most of you had had an x-ray at one point or another in your life. MRIs a little less common. So let's just go ahead and take a look at just for example, say you had something wrong with your knee. So what I'm showing here on, whoops, what I'm showing here on the left is an MRI of your knee. And on the right here is an x-ray of your knee. So again, if you had a broke, uh, break somewhere in this bone or a stress fracture in the bone, a crack, it would show up really nice. But here on the, on the left, you're actually seeing all the tissues that go in between all of those bones. And down here at the bottom is even a higher resolution image, again, of a knee. This is MRI on the left and an x-ray CT on the right. So what I like about this picture on the bottom is take a look. In the x-ray, there's something here. See where this white arrow is pointing to? There's something there in that x-ray CT. Can't really see what it is, but in the MRI, look at it. Look how nicely it stands out. And if that's an important uh, physiologic um, something going on, the doctor is going to want to know about that and they'll be able to see it, measure it, and then treat it in that MRI. So this is some kind of soft fluid filled, who knows, it could be a cyst, it could be uh, some sort of small growth, barely showing up on the CT stands out clear as day on the MRI because it's a soft tissue type of, of thing going on in the body. So you can immediately see how powerful that is. So why do we talk about imaging uh, in a medical physics class? It seems like this is something that doctors, people in medical school would be learning all about, right? Well, not really. It turns out MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is actually all physics and chemistry, which is, of course, why physicists love to study these things. In fact, the Nobel Prize in physiology uh, or medicine, they call it the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2003, was jointly awarded to these two gentlemen for their discoveries concerning magnetic resonance imaging. Now, they did all this work in the 70s, and of course, it was rewarded over three decades later by uh, receiving the Nobel Prize. And that prize was split 50-50 split uh, between an American chemist and an English physicist who came up with all of the details of how this technology could be applied to actually start making scans. Um, so it's all physics and chemistry. It's utilized in medicine, sure, and ordered by a doctor, yes. Uh, it's probably administered by a technician, for sure. But the underlying technology that enables all of this comes from our knowledge of physics and chemistry, which is why we're talking about this in a STEM science, technology, engineering, and math learning session. A lot of the things that are driving 21st century medicine are coming from fundamental science, which is why we love to support and study fundamental science. So now let's get into this idea, how does MRI work? Because one of the things I want you to come out of this uh, session with is a really a, a basic understanding of what's going on in MRI, all right? So let's just take a look, uh, let, let's just look at your hand, for example. There's a bunch of different size scales of everything going on in the body. So here's your hand. And if you zoom into your hand, then you see the surface of the skin looks like that. Within the surface of the skin, there's like blood vessels and the blood vessels have little cells and things in there. And then as you get within the cell, you see individual cells and chromosomes, et cetera. We are interested for this talk of understanding the human anatomy at the level of a cell, right? Your body is basically a huge collection of cells, all kinds of cells, skin cells, red blood cells floating in the blood, lung cells, liver cells, bone cells, right? So it's all the cells, this is basic biology, that come together to form tissue and organ structures, right? So all we have to do is understand what's going on inside a cell. So here is a schematic of what a human type of typical human cell looks like. A human cell is kind of like a little sack of water. Uh, it's got a nucleus at the middle where our DNA resides, and then it's surrounded by a bunch of other stuff, but it's like a small little uh, micron-sized baggie of water with a bunch of chemicals and important things floating around in there. The key is what I just said. It's mostly a little bag of water. Water is going to be the key idea for MRI. So your body is composed of a lot of different cells, and within those cells, there are tons of different molecules. We're gonna see how many molecules. It turns out 99% of all the molecules in your body 
are actually water, right? So you're composed of a lot of different stuff. There's no doubt about it. But most of the stuff that makes up you is just water. We are essentially just water, right? So by a percentage of mass in your body, your body's about 65% mass, but by a percentage of just counting up the molecules, 98.73% of the molecules in your body are all water. And let's look at the water composition in your body. Your brain, 75% water. Your blood, 83% water. Your heart, 79% water. The bones, 22. Well, that makes sense. Bones seem a little dry and brittle, but all the other tissues, muscles, liver, kidneys, it's all above 70% water. You're essentially mostly water, which of course is why it's so important to stay hydrated. In fact, we can make an estimate of how much water Waters inside of you, and what we wind up is one seven zero 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 water molecules in your body. That's a hundred and seventy trillion water molecules in the body. That is a lot of water molecules, and that's important because MRI is going to be working on all of those water molecules. So we've specifically chosen it to act on water because there's so much water inside of you. That's why we do it. Okay. First bit of physics and chemistry you need to understand. MRI acts on, or I'm gonna say it talks to the water molecules in your body. And we've already seen that there's a lot of them. So what is a water molecule exactly? Well, a water molecule is one of the smallest structures uh, going on inside your body. It kind of looks like this. It is an oxygen atom shown here in red and over here in red. And it is chemically bonded to a hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom. And over here, those hydrogen atoms are shown as white, and here they're shown as green. So every water molecule, if you could see it, it's too small to see, but if you could, it would kind of look like this. A big old oxygen molecule, and it's surrounded by two hydrogen molecules. And of course, that's why we call it H2O, right? Most people have heard that, even if you've never taken a chemistry class, because people who sell water will always make uh, puns of the word H2O or something. So H2O is water, and we call it H2O because it is two atoms of hydrogen, that's the h sub two, one atom of oxygen, which is the big O. H2O is water. And I'm saying that right here. It is one atom of oxygen, which is a much bigger atom, and it's bound to two atoms of hydrogen, which are actually much smaller. Okay, so that's every water molecule in your body. It looks like that. So now let's take a look at just the hydrogen atom. We need to understand the hydrogen atom a little bit. Hydrogen is the simplest most abundant atom in the entire universe. And it's composed of just one proton and one electron. If you kind of want to think of it, it's not a great picture, but it's kind of like a planetary system where the proton uh, is uh, the, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom and it's big and it kind of sits at the middle and the electron is a smaller thing and it's kind of an orbit around the proton. It is the simplest atom in the universe. And every hydrogen atom looks just like that, one proton and one electron. Here's another schematic of that then, where I'm taking this H2O molecule that you were seeing before, which remember was one atom of oxygen, two atoms of hydrogen, and I'm showing here what it looks like if we could see the protons and electrons within it. So again, here's the H2, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen, and the hydrogen atom is just a proton at the middle. And the reason I have to explain that is because MRI is actually only talking to just the protons in the two hydrogens in every water molecule, okay? That's, I, we don't have to go any deeper than that. The fundamental science is MRI, the action it's going to induce inside you, it is speaking to the protons in the hydrogen atoms in the water molecules in your body. And that proton inside the hydrogen atom, inside the water molecule is really, really, really tiny. But, but as you can see on the screen, there are 340 trillion of them in your body. So it's a small thing, but there's a lot of them. And when they all act together, we can actually use them to make some measurements inside your body. And that's what we're going to be doing. All right, so we're talking to the protons in the water molecule. You got that, that's all you need to know for that. How do we talk to the protons in the water molecules in your body? Well, the physics is this, every proton is actually like a teeny tiny little magnet. It's a small little magnet, it's really small, but it's still a magnet. And you guys know something about magnets because you're used to like refrigerator magnets and you stuck stuff to walls and you know what that magnetic field feels like when something that's magnetic gets attracted to something else. And the example I like to use is a compass needle. A compass needle is a magnet. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually held an actual 
physical compass, not the compass on your phone, but a real compass. Uh, even a simple dime store compass or a Cracker Jack compass might look something like this. This is the basis of a compass. And, and we humans have been using these for thousands of years, actually, um, to point north. This is a small little magnet, and usually one tip is pointed red like this. And this magnetic needle, which you're seeing here, is actually free to rotate, all right? So this is a small little magnet and it's on a pin. And that pin can let this thing spin around wherever it wants. So it's free to spin. But because it's magnetic, it actually feels the magnetic field of the Earth. And in one of my previous lectures, we talked about the magnetic field of the Earth, right? Because the magnetic field kind of emerges from the North Pole and ducks into the South Pole of the Earth, and it keeps us safe from all the cosmic radiation coming from the sun. So it's there. We don't feel it every day, but we are living in a magnetic field right now. And that small little magnet inside a compass, it feels the magnetic field of the Earth, and it will always point towards the north. And of course, that's why navigators use this compass. No matter which way you stand or how you turn, this little thing is always pointing true north. And then you can use that to navigate your way north. All right. So that's how a magnet acts in a magnetic field. The protons do the exact same thing. So just like that compass needle, a proton is a magnet and it's free to rotate and point in any direction it wants. So do you think that much like the compass needle, the protons in your body line up with the Earth's magnetic field and all the protons in your body are pointing north? No, they don't. Why? Because the magnetic field of Earth is far too weak. In theory, they could. In theory, they should. But in reality, the magnetic field of Earth is really, really weak. And the protons in your body, are they're getting bumped around all the time. So it kind of looks like this figure one over here. They this little arrow tells you, yeah, it's a, ma it's a magnet. But they don't line up with the magnetic field of Earth. They're just, it's too weak. And they're just being bombarded by all, so, you know, they're running into each other. and They can't stay pointing in any one direction for any length of time at all. So we solve that though. So if the Earth's magnetic field is too weak, how about if we put you inside a really, really, really strong magnetic field? And that's what we're doing with MRI. We're gonna put your whole body inside a huge magnetic field, the strongest magnetic field we can build. And in fact, we know with MRI, the stronger that field is, the better the MRI is going to be. Of course, it'll be more expensive though. And that's why we don't have super, super, super strong magnetic fields, but the magnetic field inside an MRI is really strong. And we're going to put your whole body inside that magnetic field. And then all the protons in your body will line up with that field. And it'll look like this figure two here. All right. So that's what this machine is really doing. So this is a picture of an MRI machine. If you ever go get one, it looks like this. It kind of looks like an X-ray CT, looks like a donut. But the MRI is actually much longer. It's a much fatter instrument than an X-ray CT. They both look kind of the same. But the MRI, if you know what you're looking for, it's going to be a little bit different. It's longer and clunkier. And if you see a cutaway of it, it's going to look like this. So this is what an MRI machine looks like with a patient lying inside it. So if you've ever had an MRI or ever have to have one, this is what's going to happen. They'll put you on the table. They're going to slide you down the bore of this giant donut. And all that giant donut is doing is it's creating an incredibly strong magnetic field. And it is so strong that all the protons in your body are going to say, oh my gosh, I feel a magnetic field now. And they are going to line up along that field. And in this picture, the field is actually running along the bore of the magnet. So the magnetic field is probably like running in this case from the patient's feet to their head. And all the protons feel that and they're going to snap into alignment and align along that field. When that happens, you don't feel anything. You really don't. You, you can't feel those protons doing that. It really makes no difference at all to your body, whether they're lined up or not, which is really weird, but it's really true. It's completely painless. You won't ever feel anything of that happening. Why? Because they're so small. They're just really, really, they're, they're, they're atomic. They're subatomic, the proton, actually. You cannot feel subatomic things. It's, it's way smaller than anything going on inside your body. You will be completely unaware of it, and yet it's all happening, okay? So you might say, oh, Dr. Azy, that, that strong magnetic field, that's, that's really strong. Is that dangerous to anybody? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Actually, if you look at this picture, you see this yellow caution tape on the floor? Yeah, and you can see that yellow caution tape over here too. That yellow caution tape is there for a reason. That magnetic field is so strong, you're safe going inside of it. But if anything metallic and magnetic comes into that room, big, big problem. So I'm showing three different pictures of what can happen. Uh, here's an MRI machine that someone's brought a patient bed too close to. And uh-oh, there must be something magnetic in this patient bed. And so if you ever take a little refrigerator magnet, just do this yourself next time you have a refrigerator magnet near your refrigerator and you hold it close and you feel it snap into place like that, kind of strong as you get close, 
this is doing that. But imagine that little snapping times a factor of 10,000, 100,000. It is able to pull this bed from the other side of the room. Look at this picture over here. Here's some kind of scaffolding or something. It looks like some workers were in the room and uh oh, they brought their metal scaffolding too close. And this thing probably launched from about 10 feet away and smashed into the bore of that MRI. Here's another example here. This looks like some kind of instrument stand or something like that, because I see a drawer sticking out. These would be common in a procedure room. You know, the technicians are keeping all the stuff inside there. But if there's anything magnetic in here, that magnetic field from the MRI machine is going to grab that thing and pull it right on in. That can make it dangerous. So when you go for an MRI, I've talked to the technicians who administer, this, administer these uh, several times. They will ask you many, many, many questions to really make sure you don't have anything metallic on you at all. Uh, it's really important when you go into that room. No necklaces, no jewelry. They're very interested if you have implants. Has anything uh, occasionally ever gotten into your body? They worry about have you had an industrial accident in the past where maybe a piece of metal was lodged inside your skin because that actually can get torn out. Um, sometimes there have been some reports of people with tattoos. Uh, who have highly ferromagnetic inks. The red inks in a tattoo are oftentimes caused by a ferric oxide material, which is magnetic. And that, the, the ink that makes the tattoo have a certain color, that will respond to the magnetic field and can be uncomfortable. So if you're going for an MRI and the nurse or technician is giving you that screening, please pay attention to it. It's really important you answer those questions honestly, because they're just trying to keep you safe. And don't get close to it with anything magnetic, and which would include your credit cards. You certainly cannot go in there with your wallet, or else that's called degaussing. All the magnetic uh, strips on all of your bank cards, those will be completely erased. All right. So it's completely harmless to you as long as you don't have anything magnetic on you, which normally you should not. Okay. So now let's see what happens. I'm showing a little animation here, and let's look at the words. If you're just laying ah, inside that MRI machine, and all your protons are lined up with the magnetic field, you can lay there forever, and nothing bad will ever happen, but we also can't take a measurement inside your body. So now we have to do something so we can talk to those protons, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to tip them over. Once all these protons are aligned in this picture here, so I'm showing them all pointing from the bottom of the screen to the top, let's say that's aligned along the magnetic field. We are going to apply some painless radio waves into your body, and those radio waves are going to talk to the protons and make them tip over away from the direction of the magnetic field. All right. And again, the radio waves are completely harmless as well. How do I know that radio waves are harmless? Because I'm being inundated with them right now. If I had a transistor radio, which I don't have on me, but if I did, I could hold it up, turn it on, and I'd be getting in a radio broadcast from a station maybe over in Detroit. How can that be? Because the radio waves are coming from the broadcasting tower in Detroit all the way to my house, and they're flooding this room right now. You don't feel them. Radio waves, again, completely harmless. They pass through you. You don't feel them at all, but they are here all the time. So again, uh, when you guys, if you ever go into a car and turn on the radio, that radio waves are passing through the car all the time. You don't feel them. Very harmless to you. But I bring up this analogy of radio because it's really, really important. So if you're in the car and you have to tune in a radio station uh, to listen to the radio. So if you have the old fashioned, again, not Internet radio or anything, but an actual radio station, which usually still exists in cars. When you turn on the radio, you can't just turn on the radio and listen to music. You have to turn the tuning knob. It could be digital, could be analog. But whatever that knob is, you have to tune into the station to be listening to the right frequency of radio waves. All right, that's called what tuning in means. And then when you want to listen to a different station, you turn the knob and tune to a different frequency of radio waves. Okay, that's called a resonance, right? The resonance means that your radio machine is only listening to that one particular frequency. You have to tune your radio to the frequency of the radio waves you want to listen to, 93.3, 104.3, 107.9, things like that. All right, Those numbers in the radio stations are the frequencies, and you're setting the knob to listen to just that frequency. That's the resonance. So just like you have to tune in a radio to those waves to get these protons to tip over, you can't just beam in any random radio waves. It's a very, very, very specific frequency of radio waves. And when you do that, at that just that magic frequency, the protons say, aha, I feel that, and then they tip over. So that's the resonance. So remember, MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. We've talked about why you need a strong magnetic field. That's the M. Now we know what the R is, resonance, beaming in a certain radio wave to make those protons tip over. That's the R bit of MRI. 
All that's left now is to listen to the protons and try to make an image. So here's the thing. After those protons tip over, we turn off that radio wave. So the protons were all lined up. They tip over. Then we turn it off and we just let it be. When you do that, those protons all on their own are going to return to the alignment with that super strong magnetic field. They're aligned with the magnetic field. You tip them over and then you let them return to their equilibrium position, which is pointing along the magnetic field. When they do that, they give off a signal that we can listen to. We listen to them returning to their preferred alignment. So I call this listening to the protons. Right. So really, here is the kind of sequence of things that are happening. When you just first go in, before you go into the magnetic machine, all the protons in your body are just randomly positioned. They're doing nothing. You go into the MRI machine, that super strong magnetic field, all the protons line up. Then when the technician begins the scan, he or she is going to beam some radio frequency waves into you. It looks like this, causes those protons to tip. And then they turn that radio frequency off and then they listen to the signal as the protons return back to their normal alignment. These protons are now emitting signal, which the technician is going to collect and use to make an image of inside your body. So that's what I mean by listening. It's not listening in the sound kind of sense. It's electromagnetically listening, but it is at a radio frequency. So it is like they have turned your body into a radio transmitter. They really have. The MRI has turned all the protons into your body into a radio transmitter. It's now beaming out a signal that they can listen to right inside the machine. It sounds like magic. It is not. It is science. It is amazing. And it is incredible that this works, clearly deserving of a Nobel Prize, no doubt in my mind. Okay, so let's just kind of resummarize those things. So what's the point of all this? Number one, you go into an MRI scanner, that super strong magnetic field, that field's on all the time. As you're lying there, all the protons align along that permanent field. We then beam in a signal, the resonance part. We're beaming in a radio wave that's gonna tip those protons over. Step three, we now listen. We turn off that radio signal. We listen to your body because as the protons realign with the magnetic field, which they always will, they will emit a signal that we can measure. And we measure that from outside your body. We don't have to cut you open. We don't have to do anything internally. All the protons in the water molecules all over your body are beaming out a radio signal. And just like the radio signal from the tower comes into my house or my car, those radio waves from inside your body come out of your body. We collect them outside painlessly. You don't ever feel a thing during any of this. Here's the key, step number four. It turns out that luckily, eh, I mean, it's not chance, it's physics and chemistry, of course, but luckily all the different tissues, water, fat, muscle, bone, brain matter, cartilage, ligaments, all these soft tissues we're talking about, they all have that return at a slightly different speed. Some are fast to come back to alignment and some are like, oh, I'm gonna take my time and come back to alignment. They do it at a different speed and we can measure that. And because it is different, and because we can measure it, we can now tell what different type of tissue is giving off that signal. And that's what we're going to need to make these exquisite maps of your anatomy. So that difference in time, whether it's fast to realign or slow to realign, we call that relaxation in MRI imaging. All right. So it's the relaxation because it relaxes back to its equilibrium position. And that's going to tell us what all the different tissue types are that are giving off these radio waves. And that's what's going to make measurements of relaxation time that look like pictures. So here's what I'm talking about. Here's again, two pictures of a knee. Uh, on the left here uh, is a scan from a uh, relaxation time map of a pediatric, that means a child's knee, feasibility to clinical one and a half Tesla MR imaging system. So this is a this is the standard MR machine uh, that's that you're using in a hospital. And you can see they're just mapping inside this patient's knee, all every different color here is a different relaxation time. So you can see that these bits that look like bone are taking a long time to relax. And some of the soft tissue in between, uh, not quite as long, but these soft, this really super soft tissue in between is very quick to return to normal. All right, so bone, ligaments, cartilage, they all have a slightly different tissue. So what you're doing in an MR is you're making an image of the different times you're measuring, and then it looks something like this. 
in this image, it's not like a certain T2, oh, it's 61 milliseconds. I guess that's a ligament. No, that's not it. The doctors, the radiologists who read these charts, they know that that image uh, is telling them about different types of tissues. And then they can infer what each of these different tissue anatomic structures is. The MRI image doesn't tell you what that structure is, but because it's different, it provides contrast. And then you need the medical knowledge, the anatomic knowledge to actually interpret that image as to what these different systems are. But again, here's another beautiful image uh, of a knee. One of the greatest things that MR is used for that uh, X-ray CT is not used for at all is brain imaging. Uh, it's one of the most common modalities for imaging the brain. And the cool thing about MR is just by changing the parameters of your conditions, you get images with different contrasts. Like what I'm showing here is the exact same human's brain and the same slice through the brain, but you can see that the colors are different in every picture. And that's because the technician is able to change some of the conditions of the experiment to highlight certain types of structures. So for example, uh, over here, you can see this beautiful structure inside the brain. Over here, you don't see those structures quite so much. They're looking at different things. So depending on what the physician or radiologist or pathologist needs to see, they can tune the experimental conditions to bring out the greatest amount of contrast in their image. And sometimes, there are some structures in the brain that are so subtle you can't see them at all. So it's not at all uncommon when you undergo a scan for the nurses or technicians to actually hook up an IV to you, intravenous drip. And within that IV, there could be a paramagnetic substance. We call that a contrast agent. So they are intentionally going to inject something very dilute but it is magnetic. So remember I told you before having anything magnetic in you is bad. This stuff is so dilute, it's not bad, but it is magnetic and it's easily visible on an MRI. So let's take a look at that. So this is uh, a defect of the blood brain barrier after a stroke. So if you just look at the image on the left, this was pre-contrast agent. Can you tell where the stroke was? Uh, a doctor probably would. I'm not a medical doctor. I, I can't. I see some difference in these cavities here. Something's going on, but it's a little hard to see. On the right, they have actually pushed the substance, which is usually gadolinium, standard contrast agent. It's safe for you. Don't worry. But they push the gadolinium into your bloodstream. It goes up. It penetrates. A stroke is a bleed inside the brain. And now look. Look at how clearly that bleed inside the brain stands out. Now the doctor knows immediately where that brain is. That bleed is inside your brain and they can go in and take some action. X-rays won't see this at all. Normal MRIs, not so much. Beautiful image due to the pushing of that contrast agent. Um, some people actually do, they look at your blood vessels with this. So this is called magnetic resonance angiography. Look at these beautiful images of all the blood vessels inside your brain, uh, inside coming out of your heart and going through your neck. Uh, this is down by your kidneys and the femoral arteries and different types of structures. So this can be done with uh, x-ray CT, but can also be done with MRI. Uh, there are different clever ways they have of processing the image such that it makes all the vasculature really stand out. So that's another really cool thing that MRI I can do if they want to. Now, here's a cool thing. I've shown you a lot of pictures. You would think MRI is intrinsically a 3D image. It's true. We're getting all the data from your body, but we don't really look at it in 3D. So here's a picture of, you know, Han Solo and the crew, and they're, they're looking at a, this beautiful 3D schematic of the Star Killer base. You know, they're planning how the X-Wings are going to come in and attack, and this is what all futuristic things look like. So you would imagine that the doctors, when they're looking at the MRI of your body, they have the same thing. It's some kind of 3D rotating holograph of your body in space. It's actually not true. That's not how we look at MR images. Um, what we do instead is we use slices. So let's just take a look at that. So on the right, I'm actually showing the 3D images that are generated by MRI. So you really do get 3D images. It turns out we, the doctors don't look at it that way because we can't. They don't like to. There's a better way to look at it. So here's something on the top and here's something on the bottom that we've done 3D scans with MRI. Do you guys know what those things are? I bet you do. Yeah, that's a pumpkin on the top, clearly, right? You can see the stalk and all the seeds. And there's a cantaloupe down at the bottom. 
right? So again, I mean, you know that MRIs can see inside you. Now you were looking at the seeds and all the structure inside the cantaloupe and the pumpkin. Um, so a 3D image looks like that. And sure, it looks inside, but for a doctor, how can they tell where that seed is? It's not really useful. So what they do is they take that three-dimensional image. So instead of a pumpkin, it's like a three-dimensional image of your head and they just view it in slices. So you can see once I have three-dimensional data, I can look at slices across your head that way. I can look at slices from front to back. I can look at slices top down. And that's really the preferred way that physicians, uh, radiologists, pathologists would prefer to look at MR images. They're going to look at individual slides and scroll through them. Same kind of idea here. Here's a three-dimensional MR image of a brain kind of spinning in space. Beautiful 3D picture. It's cool, but because it's 3D, you can't actually look inside at what you want. So a doctor would rather say, I don't need the full 3D data. I'm going to go through that brain from top to bottom, and then they're going to stop at a certain slice. And oh, here's a bleed that that person or a lesion that that person is looking at. And they can scroll through these images with the mouse wheel on their mouse, just like you guys can scroll through things at home. And they can start at the top of the brain and just look through successive slices. They can look at slices from left to right. And that just gives them a really good feel for exactly where these things are. And then they can take measurements on it as well. Slices just work better. So although we're really generating three-dimensional images, we're really looking at the slices. So you can see here's a kind of picture of this thing. What is that? Clearly a banana. And then here you're just showing the various slices of the banana as the cuts go through that. And so that physician with their with her um, the mouse wheel, she can stop at any slice she wants. Look at the surface, look inside, look underneath it. It's no problem. It's just an easier way to see it. Then they build up a map in their mind. And of course, again, on the right, I'm showing a series of slices from top to bottom of what? What is that? Yeah, it's a corn cob, right? It just works better. So usually they can either do that with the mouse wheel or a lot of times if they're looking at these slices, they'll just have all the slices and they'll just put them side by side like this. So uh, again, these, these, this is why people go into the medical field. It's a very valuable and highly skilled profession. It takes years of experience to understand what you're looking at in an image like this. But for a head doctor, they can look at this MR and see all the various slices side by side. And when they look at all of them, that builds up a three-dimensional map in their mind. But anytime they want, they can zoom in. Oh, on one particular slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, or slice. I think I see that um, looking at a particular structure in there. And then they can tell, does it extend underneath the slice? Is it above the slice? how far left, right, things like that. So really looking at slices is, is generally the way things are done uh, medically. So really that's about it. That's all I have for you. So let's just review. So we've seen, I think you understand roughly what MRI is now. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And we know that MRI acts on all the protons, which exist in the hydrogen atoms in the water molecules of your body. So stay hydrated, very important. We know that the MRI machine is a really, really strong magnet, and that magnet's on all the time. That's the M in MRI. When you go into that magnet, all the protons in your body line up with the magnet, and then we turn the protons inside your body into radio transmitters. And we do that by tipping those things over and then watching them realign with the magnetic field. And that's the resonance. We tune in a special radio wave to the frequency that those protons want to speak at and tip them over. And then we listen as they line back up with the magnetic field. And then we exploit the fact that all tissues, muscle, bone, red blood cells, gray matter in your brain, white matter in your brain, water, ligaments, cartilage, they all line up with the magnetic field at a different rate, close, but slightly different. And that allows us to tell the difference between all these different tissue types. Um, so this just makes uh, something that's really good at soft tissue because they look similar, but they have slightly different relaxation times, and that makes us able to resolve them. And that's the I part in the imaging, MRI. So all in all, this physics and chemistry turns MRI into one of our safest, most powerful imaging methods. It is an absolutely uh, miraculous feat of technology that allows us to see inside your body. 21st century medicine is so exciting. It is such an interesting area of physics to study, and I hope some of you guys get excited about it and decide, wow, this is what I want to spend my life doing, inventing better machines, faster machines, more powerful machines, machines that are smaller, machines we can put on ambulances so we can bring this medical diagnostic 
very important to more people and get those scans quicker and faster and more accurate to improve outcomes, to save lives. This is what medical physics is all about, a really exciting area to work in. I hope some of you consider doing that in the future. So that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, I hope you found uh, some of this interesting. I know I had a great time talking with you. I'll be here again in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk again, another exciting topic. I hope you tune in then. So for now, Professor Raisi, University of Windsor, thanks so much for spending some time with me. Have a great day.